Hello, I'm Kashaf Chowdhury, and welcome to a very special Hangout. Africa's wildlife is in danger, and no more so than in South Africa, where this year more than 800 rhinos will be killed by poachers. The poaching and trafficking industry is now worth $17 billion, with rhino horn worth more than gold. And the poaching of rhinos has increased by 3,000% in the last six years. But what's fueling this demand? Who are the poachers, and can they be stopped? Now, I'll be asking these questions and many more to my guests who'll be joining me shortly. Of course, we'd like you to be a big part of this conversation. So make sure you send us your reactions and questions on Twitter. Just use hashtag Wildlife Warzone, and we'll bring your comments into the discussion. Now, Al Jazeera has just finished broadcasting Wildlife Warzone, a fascinating series following young South Africans as they train to become anti-poaching rangers. And here's a clip of the boys in action. After the police had left and we finally got clearance to start the, um, the autopsy on the rhino, um, I got really involved. We tried to trace the bullet from the entrance point. There was no exit point for the bullet, so we knew it had to be somewhere inside of the rhino. If they can find the bullet, they may be able to identify the gun that was used. Now, joining me now to discuss what's happening across South Africa and the rest of the region is Nabil, who was one of the trainees in the series, Vince Barkas, owner of ProTrack, the company Training Rangers, Matthew Norville from the Wildlife Foundation in Cape Town, Mark Strickson, the director of Wildlife Warzone, and Ki Yen Vu from Education for Vietnam, a conservation organisation based in the country. Now, I'm going to start with a view on the ground. Nabil was a trainee with the guys we just saw, but found the training tough going. Now, for those who haven't seen the series, here's what happened. March moves at a punishing pace. After only 10 minutes, Nabil is struggling. The march was was uh, was quite rough. Started out um, feeling strong, but only a few minutes after the plus minus 30, 40 kgs on our backs got quite heavy. Um, Oak started struggling, especially one of our mates, Abil. I got funny pains, you know, all over. Uh, I started getting weak, you know, um, getting cramps, you know. I just, I just didn't give up hope because uh, to think you're coming from so far. Every time I fell down, I got back up. Nabil, that looked brutal, and I can see you're looking a lot better now. What happened? Well, um, at the beginning of the walk, um, I was like, as you've heard me, clips, after 10 minutes, uh, I started getting tired, I was unfit. Um, I wasn't able to prepare for it. We were like, you know, Carrying 40 cages, 30 plus minus, 30 to 40 cages of uh, backpacks on our back. And I've heard that it had been like a half an hour to an hour's walk, let's say about four, six kilometers. And I got weaker, I got weaker and weaker as I've been told. But you know, the guys were supportive, they helped me throughout. You know, there was a time I thought to myself, I, I can't do anymore. And 
you know, I just never gave up hope because just that thing clicked in my head. And then I've been coming from Port Elizabeth in the East to give which is a way the other side of South Africa. Uh, you know, I just didn't give up. You know, I decided to complete and with the support of the guys, I, I made it to the end of the walk. Yeah. And what I wanted to ask you is, I, I know that for those that haven't seen the series and those that have, they know that you um, were hurt quite badly. You hurt your arm and you had to drop out of the course. So were you able to go back and complete the, the Ranger course? Yes, yes, I, I, I could go back. Um, after I got hurt, um, we went to the doctor and found out that I just a couple of nerves back in my back and my spine. Um, you know, it was it was a long period of time waiting between the time I went to the doctor and actually having to find the new problems if I could stay or go back. Um, so what happened was um, the doctor told me that uh, I couldn't carry on due to me missing a lot of training. And I did go back actually, and uh, it was that was a good that was I was disappointed at first, but me going back, I knew I had to be fit, um, be well prepared, and you know just get there and finish up. Okay, and so you're now a fully qualified ranger. Yes, I am, which I'm very happy about. Very good. And I and where are you working at the moment, or are you still looking? At the moment, kind of looking around. Um, you know, there's a lot of places I apply to. You know, sent out to. Um, there were a couple of places that followed us on Facebook as we were training. Um, but once I got back, and it's still a process. It's still a whole process. Um, but at the moment, nothing at the moment. You know, just helping out here and there with my dad's work and so forth. Okay. Um, I mean, the what we could see through the series is that that training is brutal because I guess you're going to be up against well-trained poachers and of course that's what we're talking about poaching and I want to show a clip of what happens to a rhino when it's been attacked and I've got to warn you these are brutal pictures of the aftermath but I think it's important that we see them. In the footage you're watching this rhino from an Eastern Cape private game reserve had its horn hacked off while it was still alive. Vets and wildlife managers tried in vain to save its life, but the wounds were too severe and it had to be put down. OK, so we've um, been having comments coming through our Facebook site and on our Twitter feed. And here's one from Gid Banda. And he says, when will my fellow Africans appreciate the beauty of our beloved continent? Sometimes we simply have to act responsibly without being told. The big five, which are lions, African elephants, Cape buffalo, leopard and rhinoceroses, are in Africa. And if this behaviour continues, in 10 years' time, Africa will lose its unique identity. Wake up, Africa. Right. Um, so now, Matthew, you work for Wilderness Foundation in South Africa trying to protect wildlife, including rhinos. And this clip was released by your organisation. And to most of us, it's hard to understand why anyone could be this cruel. And how are these animals being poached? Oh, it's, a, it's a number of uh, different ways. The bottom line, though, is that the animals either get shot with uh, high-caliber hunting rifles or they get immobilized with veterinary um, um, supplies that, that um, drop the animal to allow the people to, to hack their horns off. But again, the tragedy is that um, ultimately the animal dies. There have been some cases where, for example, that in the video clip where the animal survived for some time, but ultimately that, that, um, that rhino also died or was put down. Um, and you can imagine the, the incredible pain that that animal had to endure um, while it was still alive. So yeah, bottom line is it's a, it's a, it's, it's a hunting activity. Uh, the animal has to get it shot or dropped in such a way that the horn can be, can be cut off. I mean, rhino poaching has surged over the last decade, as we talked about. But it's not a recent phenomenon, is it? I mean, what was the situation before? Yeah, there's, I mean, they, of course, there's always been, been poaching um, and for rhino at a fairly lowish level over the years. But I think just the demand and also the, the value has increased 
so much over the last couple of years that it's just um, made it worthwhile for for these individuals to to get involved. Um, and so the um, financial reward at this stage does seem to be um, make it worth the risk, uh, certainly at uh, at the high level. And bearing in mind that the guys on the ground uh, are always expendable, so there'll always be enough people that you could find to to do the legwork. Well, when we're talking about the guys on the ground, I mean, you know, Vince, you're the person who trains the rangers out in the field every day. Uh, I mean, who are these poachers that your your trained rangers are trying to catch? The guys we're trying to catch you know, come from across the, the spectrum of our population in South Africa, from your very poor to middle class, you're really affluent, affluent class that doesn't know any other standard with the amounts of money involved in it, and anybody can get involved. Okay, and in terms of trying to stop them, what measures do you think have been the most successful? And that's actually a question from Ashley on Twitter. I think the, one of the most overlooked options we've got, we keep throwing bullets and weapons at this problem. And more has to be done with education and awareness. What I know a lot of people very ignorantly, they say, shoot to kill, kill the poacher. What you've got to understand at the ground level is when you shoot and kill somebody's father, you turn an entire community family against conservation. So long term, you dig in a bigger hole for yourself as far as protecting wildlife. Is I, I know it's got to be done, it's unfortunate, but we should be putting more effort into education and awareness of our local communities. Okay. Well, Kien, you're the director of Education for Nature in Vietnam. Can you, and, you know, traditionally, what's happened is that a lot of these animal parts are sent to Asia. And I know particularly with rhino horn, it's Vietnam. I mean, what, what is fueling this demand? Um, rhino horn is consumed by a very small group of wealthy people in the society. According to a recent study by traffic, 5% uh, of 700 people interviewed in Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi cities admitted that they either had bought or, been, or used rhino horn. And the rhino horn is used as a, a status symbol or as a magic medicine that can cure a range of different health problems, including cancer. And people think that that's what it does, but there, is there any medical evidence for any of the claims that are made? Well, there's no scientific evidence that indicating that rhino horn works. Actually, you know, there's a scientific, a scientific study say that rhino horns is just like a buffalo horns or fingernails. So our message to the public is that instead of killing a rhino and use its horns, you should choose your own fingernails. And what what are the other so what are you doing exactly as an organization to try and stem that demand? Uh, we has been been carrying out a range of awareness activity. We work with TV stations, uh, journalists, and carry out the public events to encourage the Vietnamese not to use rhino horn. Uh, we produce public service announcements, working with corporates and companies to encourage them. Uh, and they employ not to use rhino horn. We also work with car, car dealerships 
because rhino horns is used by wealthy people. So we, do, so we think that a lot of rhino horn users have their own car. So uh, we work with them and encourage them to buy cars instead of using rhino horn. So rhino horn ultimately is being used as a status symbol. Yes. It's incredible. Um, but it's also, Matthew, I, I wanted to come to you because when we're talking about the demand, obviously, if most of the rhinos are being killed in Africa and particularly South Africa. Can you just give us an idea of the journey of the horn from Africa to Asia? I mean, how's it getting there? And also, who are these people? We're, we're talking major crime syndicates. Are we talking small time uh, small time poachers? Yeah, look, I mean, to get, a, to get any um, contraband of a country and into another one, you, you've got to be organized. So it's not a it's not an insignificant uh, activity. I think it's fairly well known that the, the, the route is also quite diverse. Um, a lot of South Africans' ports of, of, of exit, and certainly some of Southern Africans' ports of exit, are fairly porous. So it's um, you know that's it's fairly well known. I think there's there's definitely links between um, wildlife trade and other illicit trades, whether it's it's um, uh, drugs as an example. So there's probably pretty good evidence that um, wildlife products, including horn, are going out, and um, some of these syndicates are being paid um, in in drugs that are coming back into the country. And so we always say that you know the concern is obviously um, the effect on our on our wildlife and conservation, but it's also it's an it's a national and international security issue. You know, um, are we are we comfortable? Would any country be comfortable that these activities are taking place not only in the country but across across our borders? But it's also important to remember that not all the poachers are working for big crime syndicates, are they? I mean, one of the poachers interviewed on Wildlife Warzone talks about hunting for food as meat is so expensive. Here's his story. Uh, so now remember, we want as many comments from you, the audience, so please do send us your comments via Twitter using hashtag Wildlife Warzone. Um, we've got one here from Lawrence Wodang, and he says, wow, I remember back in the 80s in Africa, if an elephant was killed, the whole village could eat meat for weeks, obviously. Um, now, Mark, can you tell us about the poacher we just saw in that clip? I mean, the situation is complicated, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very sad situation. Um, you get a, you get in the townships. Um, the rangers are living in one house in a street, and then maybe a few doors down, there's somebody who's poaching, who's setting trap um, to get meat for their family. And uh, there's a very powerful moment in the series where one of the guys who's a poacher says, look, um, you can't blame these rangers. I would do the same. I would arrest you. We're here both for the same reason. We're trying to help our families. You see, I, rem I also remember that in there's, a, there's a quite an experienced ranger called Sergeant Toomey who talks about how when he was younger, he and his father used to go hunting quite quite openly and it was not a problem and that's how they used to that how that's how they used to eat and what he actually said was that now you've got fences have gone up 
all around the reserves and it's almost it's restricted it's restricted movement there's a reason why these fences have gone up but what it's also done is it they they've now started charging people to go into the reserves and he he says that people have a disconnect with the animals because they very rarely see wild animals uh, so if you're not seeing an animal you're why would you care about it? You don't see it openly. I mean, that, that's what you sort of, that's the general feeling you got from talking to people while you were there filming. Yeah, very much. And it was amazing to go in with the trainee rangers because some of them hadn't seen my animals before. And as Toomey said, if you don't see animals, why would you care about them? True. I mean, the big issue with the guys who are hunting for meat is they set snares with wild. And of course, that doesn't just have animals that like deer and those sorts of things that they can hunt for meat, but it also, even a rhino could get caught in one of those snares. Okay. Well, um, the solutions, I imagine are going to be difficult here, aren't they? Because there, there's lots of things that can be done. And I guess I just want to get a, an idea from everyone about what we can do. Um, Matthew, if, we, if I start with you, we're looking for solutions. What, what do you say? You know, what does your organisation think are the solutions? Yeah, so it's a, whole, it's a whole range of activities. And I certainly agree with, uh, um, with some of the other other guys that, you know, yes, we need to work with local communities as well because it, it doesn't help that we alienate and, and you're right as well, fences have caused problems, but this is now the reality we work with. Um, so I think the, the, the to solve this problem, it's going to be a number of different activities and I'm um, very pleased to hear some of the activities taking place in, in Vietnam um, on, on the education awareness side. Um, I'm sure a lot of the, the, the the general public in some of those countries would be horrified if they if they knew what happened to a rhino to, to provide that horn. On the other hand, in, on the ground in, in South Africa and Africa generally, yeah, all the role players that are involved in anti poaching activities and trying to curb this crime, um, it's going to take that effort and more. I mean, as we speak, um, our organization and others are busy working with today, in fact, uh, with uh, port of uh, entry and exit officials trying to um, raise the skill levels to try and try and solve this as an example. So that's the kind of stuff that we do working with, with officials and agencies to try and help them to do their job, their job better. Great. Um, Vince, when we're talking about solutions, you're there on the ground. What do you think needs to be done? I believe that in order to protect our rhinos, we need to address the both end of the problem, the supply and demand, we must stop the illegal hunting in South Africa and other countries. At the same time, we must address the demand uh, in countries like Vietnam and China. Uh, we can't just say that we only address the demands or we just address the supplies or the illegal hunting, we must address both hunting and demand problems. Okay, uh, Vince, what what do you think needs to be done? Because you're you're on the ground, you just have to just yeah. I think with the rhino patch, there's no silver bullet. There's no one thing that's going to stop it. But I think to a realist, what's happening? The demand has to stop. We as Africans are going to kill one another over this natural resource, and it's going to go to the country to use it. They've got to start there, fighting as hard as we do to stop the demand. If there's no demand, the killing will stop. Okay. Um, and Mark, when you were out there, I mean, you've got an objective view on this because you're not a conservationist and you're not a ranger, you know, in your opinion, what, what do you think could be done or what could be done better? I think that, as always with conservation issues, it's about education. We need to reach people who are buying rhinos. 
and we need them to know it has no medical value whatsoever. And unless you stop the demand, you will never stop poaching. Because rhinos are basically walking around with a horn made of solid gold in terms of its work. And poor people will always be tempted to kill rhinos and take them home, so long as there is a demand. And not just poor people. It's, it's organized crime behind wildlife poaching. The same people deal with wildlife products who deal with drugs, arms, and people smuggling. These are very dangerous people. And Nabil, I'd like to go to you at the end of this because, you know, it was you that we saw training. It was your friends that we saw going through that tough training for weeks on end. To be, and you're the one who's trying to stop these guys poaching. In your opinion, what do you think? You would. What would you like to see? What would you like to happen to stop this happening? Well, first of all, I agree with Rist, uh, especially with Mark said. Uh, starting. Stop the demand, but as myself, I'm a trained ranger as of now. As of now, I'm a qualified one. So I believe one thing: we need enough manpower. Manpower at the moment now is what we need. We cannot have four or five guys on foot in about 60 to 80,000 acres of wildlife. That's that's. It's, it's not enough. Um, I believe we need enough bad power starting from now um, because you no, know, the poachers are clever. As Mark said, you know, it's crime. They are organized. It's going to be high crime. You have to be clear because um, poachers today know exactly what to do. They know the reserve. They know they pass through the reserve. They know exactly where to go through the way to come out, we have to sit at this stairs. So we have to be on our toes and on, on our game. But I believe um, the more manpower there is, um, the more the reserves can employ um, manpower and um, uh, units in order for this to stop. Because it's what's happening, it's inside the reserve, and I believe we have to start where it's happening, which is inside the reserve. Um, so as soon as that happens, we can start talking about stopping the demand and all that. Because, I mean, when once everyone starts talking about the demand, stop, it's never going to stop. It's going to carry on. It's going to carry on. It's a never-ending story. And it's, to be honest, it's a sad story. Now, Matthew, there's, there's some novel solutions out there as well in terms of trying to deal with the demand. For example, I know that there... There's some people who are dyeing the horns pink, for example, so that you can always tell that it's been poached. Uh, but what about the, the one that sort of causes a, quite a lot of argument is what about legalising the hunting? Or, the, you know, so you almost allow the trade to thrive to a certain level. And uh, so then that, what that does is it makes it legal, drops the prices, cuts demand. Well, would that work? Yeah, I mean that's a, a very controversial question, and and um, yeah, it's it's kind of the big one. Um, but we don't, and I certainly don't believe that uh, that trade will resolve the issue. Um, and I know there are many arguments uh, uh, presented uh, by people who believe it will do. Uh, we don't, and we probably haven't got time yet to get into it. But an example, uh, which is often cited as a reason to support trade in rhino horn is the, the trade in, in, in ivory from a few years ago. But I think that example, if anything, works uh, the other way around. It certainly hasn't worked for elephant. And you know, as, uh, as rhino are taking, taking a hit every day, we only have to look at, at uh, elephants that are probably um, uh, getting hammered at a, at a much more significant level. So yeah, but to answer your question, we don't believe that the trade will solve the, the issue. OK, well, this is a discussion that's going to go on. And that's all the time we have for this now. I'd like to thank Nabil, Vince, Mark, Matthew and Kien for joining us today. 
And I want to thank you, our online community at home, for contributing with all your brilliant comments. Wildlife War Zone is a six-part documentary series on Al Jazeera English, and you can watch all the films and check out some other web extras on our website. Goodbye for now.